This episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks is brought to you by Gigabyte's AMD X570 ARS motherboards for third generation AMD Ryzen 3000 processors. Hit the link in the description below for more details. On this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we're going to talk about all of the cool stuff we saw at CES 2020 and what to do to get your PC ready for Windows 10. What's going on, everybody? Marco Cipetta for Hot Hardware here. We're shaking things up a bit. Our fearless leader, Dave, had to run off last minute, so he's not here to host the show and sort of direct traffic. So I'm going to wing it. I will probably mess this up many times over the course of the show. But luckily, I have the lovely Brittany Getting and her husband, Chris, hey. pulling the strings <laughs> in the background. They're going to make sure I stay on track. What's going on, Brittany? Uh, nothing much. How are you? I'm okay. A little frazzled. I caught the yeah. CES plague. I had a little bit of a fever over the weekend when I got back from CES, but it oh, broke no. Sunday night, and I'm feeling okay today. Yeah, yeah I think the was... flu's hitting New England, from what I've heard, pretty early this year. So, yeah, are you guys all... enjoying the balmy weather up there? We have some nice weather down here in Connecticut. Um, we didn't get the balmy weather. <laughs> we got an ice storm instead. <laughs> Um, huh. So thankfully, the ice storm wasn't as bad as anticipated, and now we're back to our seasonable temperatures of roughly the mid twenties in Maine in January. So we didn't get that lovely balmy weather everyone else got on the East Coast, but that's okay. We're used to it. All right, gotcha. I've been very lucky. We're I'm, I think it's like fifty something today. It's oh, lucky. Outside. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. So Britt, um, as you know. Dave and yes. I just spent last week getting beat up in Las Vegas. <laughs> um, we published uh, our best of CES 2020 article up on the site. If you haven't been to the site, be sure to come by and flip through the news and check out our best of article. We had tons and tons of coverage from CES. Yes, we um, did. Some of the standout stuff, obviously AMD made a big splash. Um, with both uh, mobile Ryzen 4000 and a new Threadripper. Intel showed off a new graphics card. But in our best of CES 2020 piece, we sort of wrapped it up all in a nice, long, single-page article if you haven't seen it. So if you haven't been to this site, go over there now. There's the beautiful uh, image I made for the top of the article. Very nice. But yeah, so what do you say, Britt? Should we kick it off with the very cool uh, Dell Alienware Concept UFO uh, handheld device? Yes, that's the one I actually wanted to talk about the most. <laughs> cool. So this device is, is really, really wild. So they did not disclose like sp specific specs other than to say eight inch screen. And on video, we, we in our article featuring this device, we have a video showing it in action with uh, the controllers that can separate from the panel, just like a Nintendo Switch. The whole device a little bit bigger than a Nintendo Switch based right. on a future hybrid Intel processor. And yeah, so uh, apparently Dell's been working on this device for about two years. It's running full-blown Windows 10. It is a, a Windows 10 PC without the keyboard with the detachable controllers like the Switch. And yeah, it has, you know, that nice interface on top to launch your games. And, you know, it's really pretty cool. I got to hold it. I got to feel it at the, at the demo showcase. I'm kind of surprised how much I liked it. What, what do you think, Britt? Seems like a cool device, right? Um, I'm very intrigued by it, especially because I feel like the Nintendo Switch has sort of had a monopoly on this market. Um, so I think it's intriguing to see that Dell, and I believe Acer, too, also kind of released something similar, or they have it as a prototype, where now they're kind of following in the Nintendo Switch's footsteps. So I'm kind of curious to see it become fully realized, because really the Nintendo Switch has sort of been the, I mean, kind of undisputed number one when it comes to these very, like, handheld um, consoles that we haven't really seen since, let's say, the 2000s or 90s. Um, so I'm intrigued to see when it comes out and how it'll compare and whether or not people will be making the Switch over. Um, what type of specs do they have on this, Marco? Did they say? Nothing, nothing that they would actually disclose, like, in terms of hard specs, because between right. now and when or if the thing launches, all that will likely change right but what's what's so assuming it's got ice lake class graphics right it will most likely be able to play mainstream games at 1080p but one of the things that lots of people didn't talk about that i think is important with this device you know if you have steam on your pc on your big gaming pc 
you could stream your entire library to this. So even if this device okay. isn't as as powerful, you know, as powerful for AAA games as you'd like it to be, you could still stream your games from a bigger uh, desktop PC and Which get you know that full experience. Yeah, yeah it's it's really interesting because it's really a PC like. Yeah. There's nothing stopping you from plugging in a keyboard and mouse and using that as a portable tablet PC. But that whole form factor with the controllers and the charging stand, the ability to plug it into a larger display, basically having it function like a switch, but with the with PC platform inside, some intriguing possibilities. I don't know. Now, what, what I think is going to be the the real key is the price point that it launches Absolutely. at. If it's, if it's 1200 bucks, no one's buying it. No one's going to buy it, especially when you can get a Nintendo Switch for what now? Under 300 I mean. Yeah, exactly. Now, yeah. I think I was speculating with Dave. I think people would pay seven, 800 bucks because the other thing to consider, I think PC games are way cheaper than the console games. Absolutely. So for the total investment, like you could get this with a bunch of games probably more games and in aggregate be about the same price as a switch i i think so are they going know. to have it so that you can and i don't know if they clarified this because you mentioned that you can stream from let's say your, your heftier at home pc are they going to have it so that you can just put steam on there and already have access to your entire library or are you going to have to buy games separately again oh no it's a it's a windows pc it is a you, windows pc yeah, so it's, it's, it's all PC. good to go all good to go yeah it's going to work yeah. just like any other pc I can definitely see that being a draw then. And like you said, that $700, $800 price point, because you think about the Switch, yeah, it's under 300 bucks, but you still have to pay for all the games separately, right? And that adds up after a while. Um, so if you can just sign into your Steam and already have access to all the games that you have access to, or like you mentioned, PC games do tend to be a little bit cheaper, or you can wait for a really good deal and you know get them during Black Friday or whatever, that could be a real selling point. Yeah, we'll see. And I'm totally speculating on the system price. Dell gave us no information at all. It was just, you know, Dave and I kind of spitballing right. what we thought people would pay. But yeah, I, I think it, I think it was a really cool device. I hopefully, uh, you know, and based on the comments on our YouTube video and the article, like it seemed like everybody liked it. So hopefully yeah. Dell makes it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I, I'd be curious to see uh, the Nintendo Switch lose its throne. You know what I mean? See if anything could really top it off. Little coup de coup d'état de there. Yeah, we'll see. I, I, it's, <laughs> th that would be a, a be a tall order for sure, definitely. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll sure. down the list here. So one of the really cool uh, laptops that we saw was the uh, ASUS ROG Zephyrus G14, based on the AMD's latest uh, 4000 series Ryzen mobile processors. But let's let's jump right to the mobile processors because AMD like this CES in terms of PC enthusiasts, it was AMD's show. Absolutely. The, their their press conference was I, I'm gonna use the term electric only because all of the <laughs> announcements had everybody sort of worked up and excited. It was really, really cool stuff. Now, starting with the, the Ryzen four thousand series, basically you take the the strong Zen 2 core that's in the Ryzen three thousand series desktop processors, pair it to a Vega class seven nanometer GPU. So it's, you know, it's a monolithic die, but CPU and GPU on that one chip and, you know, tweak and tune the frequencies and the, the, the voltage curve. And you end up with a really compelling mobile story, at least according to AMD. We haven't had a chance to do any testing yet. All of the data we have came from AMD. So the performance claims and everything that they showed, we have not independently verified, but Based on the scuttlebutt, talking with the OEMs, making the notebooks, and based on our conversations with AMD and what was disclosed publicly, they're not going to just, you know, outright BS the numbers that they showed. Right. You know, the, the top end 4800U mobile Ryzen processor basically hanging with a uh, Core i7 9700K desktop processor in multi threaded workloads. And within a, a 45 watt, well, a 35 to 45 watt power envelope, that TDP is configurable. So potentially some really strong mobile processors from AMD coming here. Did they have a release date? So, so I'm hearing Q1 for the first Q1. notebook. Okay. So by spring, most likely not like a hard date of availability, but right. we, sh and I'm hearing that we may be able to test something early. So even Ooh. before they're available, um, we might have some it's this is it's still up in the air. We might have a, a machine to play with beforehand. I'm not mm -hmm. certain yet. 
but yeah, you know, for for years now, you know, Intel simply dominated notebooks. Right. Uh, AMD had their previous Gen 3000 series mobile processors, and they were better than the Gen before that. But Intel has simply had a stranglehold on on mobile processors. And even now that Ice Lake is here, Ice Lake is looking strong. We just put up a review of um, the Surface Pro 7 today alongside the Surface Pro X, and you can see how strong, you know, even a, a fanless Ice Lake is. But AMD's message was really good here. Now you're talking stronger graphics performance, way better multi-thread performance in the same power envelope. Now you're talking an eight-core, 16-thread processor in a thin and light. Um, that's like sort of changes the game it, it shifts what you can get in that ultra book or you know thin and light form factor and claiming strong battery life i think that's going to be the clincher i think that's right. where amd is still tweaking and tuning but there's potential for some really serious horsepower with decent battery life from these processors i'm looking forward to them yeah, and it absolutely, the competition is always good for the consumer, right? So hopefully, too, if we see AMD releasing um, a strong mobile processor, that means prices maybe will eventually go down as well. Um, and like you mentioned, Intel kind of, kind of like the Nintendo Switch has been reigning king for a while. So when someone's coming and trying to claim that throne, so we'll see what happens over the next year or so. Yeah, one of the really interesting things, there was a... Um, I'm already forgetting the name of the feature because I'm groggy, but um, <laughs> I don't think we have it in this piece. But whatever, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip the name. But so current mobile machine, you know, current gaming notebooks or notebooks with discrete graphics um, will typically feature, you know, Intel processor, NVIDIA GPU, or even if it's you know an AMD GPU, um, any sort of balancing between uh, power and thermals is kind of going through the OS first. So there's an right. extra layer of complexity there. Uh, AMD has a feature in these in this new platform where direct at the hardware and firmware level, regardless of the OS, the CPU and a discrete GPU can sort of balance the workload and boost to higher frequencies and voltages and you know turbo speeds based on how much available thermal headroom is there. So According to AMD's numbers, you know, it's about a 10% boost in performance when, when gaming on the go. But because of all the cool software features on top of that, that AMD has where you can limit the performance of the GPU um, when gaming, there's potential, you know, most of the time you look at a gaming notebook review and the battery life bar in the chart is this little sliver of time on battery while gaming. Um, AMD's kind of hinting that they'll be able to extend that bar significantly where you'll be able to actually game on battery for a decent amount of time and that's also really interesting too you know having a a, a thin and light machine with strong multi-threaded performance with a discrete gpu and the ability to game for you know longer than the current crop of notebooks it's it seems like the holy grail of gaming notebooks. We'll see. We have to wait for them to arrive. But yeah, really interested in this platform for sure. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, all AMD also went completely to the other end of the spectrum and announced the Threadripper 3990X. Basically a, a monster 64 core processor for the TRX 40 platform. We recently reviewed the 3970X and the 3960X processors, um, that those are up to 32 cores. This guy drops into the same socket, basically doubles the number of Zen 2 chiplets are in there. And uh, yeah, 64 cores coming for $3,990 to the high-end uh, desktop platform. This thing's nuts. I can't wait to check this thing out. Britt, mm -hmm. how many are you going to buy? How many of these are you guys going to buy? buy a couple, couple of these? How many are going to buy? We could maybe buy a tenth of one. <laughs> something it's so like crazy. that hundredth of you one it, it's funny that they're they're launching it, it seems crazy to see amd launching a, a nearly four thousand dollar desktop processor yeah. you know in the span of a couple of years the the fx 9590 before the first gen ryzen's hit their top end the best core that they, the best processor that they made at the time was like 200 bucks right it was right. getting decimated by intel Ryzen comes along, they change the game, they just keep iterating, improving, iterating, improving. And you know, now they have a four thousand dollar processor in their stack, more expensive than any other desktop processor from Intel. But with all these cores, like this was the real kicker at the press conference. 
and I thought it took some real moxie from AMD. They put this uh, $4,000 desktop processor up against $20,000 worth of Xeons, a, a dual processor Xeon server, and the Threadripper was faster. Oh. Which did, that, did they do that live? They did it. They did it live, like That's the demo. Gumption. <laughs> it did. You know, it was funny because normally they wouldn't. You wouldn't compare a um, a desktop processor to you know an enterprise pro or a server processor right. like a Xeon, but you really have to because there's nothing on the desktop that Intel has to compete in terms of core count. So dual Xeons with 56 cores, you know, falling victim to a single desktop processor with 64 cores in a V-Ray rendering workload. Just, it's nuts. I cannot wait to test it. I hope that I'm yeah. on the list to play with one of these things. <laughs> Definitely. And, and like you said, that takes gumption, especially because um, as Elon Musk taught us, you don't, you don't always want to do testing live, right? <laughs> you don't want to throw the, the ball out the window. <laughs> they showed the tests running, right? But it did take, like, I believe it was like an hour-long workload. Oh, okay. Like so we didn't sit and watch it completely. You didn't sit and watch it. Okay. But, I mean, it's... It makes sense, you know, when you take one of the, it's like Cinebench. If they did it with Cinebench, right. it would have finished in four seconds. So it's not like a, a heavy enough of a workload. Right, but, you need something. Yeah, and any heavy workload that's going to leverage all of those cores, you know, that that 64-core processor should have a multi-threaded lead. 64 cores, 128 threads, just, just insane, just nutty. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see how many people do choose to invest in it. Because as you pointed out, it's um, much more impressive, but also much more expensive. So we'll see how that evens out, right? There might be, um, I would imagine that there would be a market for it, but almost $4,000 is a high price. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, definitely, definitely a high price. But, you know, something to keep in mind, definitely not a processor if you're a gamer or you're just tooling around on the desktop right. this is a for, for a you know content creators for mega taskers you, you need to be running workloads to leverage all those cores to justify the price you know unless you just have a uh, you know a huge wallet and and you right. want to go for the king of the hill then fine which but if yeah. you do please contact us <laughs> yeah come hang out with us i'll buy the pizzas come, we'll come hang, hang out, out we'll us. get friendly We'll see. We'll see what we can do for each other. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I think. What do you think? Should we move on to Intel next? Yeah. Let's. Intel I mean, we've, had some. We've given a lot of attention, attention to AMD. We can move on to Intel. So anyone that has come by the site for the last, I don't know, about a year and a half now knows that Intel is going to be entering the discrete GPU market this year. Twenty twenty is the year that they said they launched their their first discrete graphics card in in generations, and we actually got to see the first one. So Intel showed off the Intel DG1 software development vehicle graphics card. So this isn't a card that you're going to be able to buy. It, this particular card that they showed is not something that's going to be on store shelves. Maybe the design language um, is similar to what comes out. Not sure, just speculating. But with Ice Lake, with next gen Ice Lake processors, they have the XE based uh, GPU within that processor. And the first gen Tiger Lakes with DG1, Intel basically carved out that same mobile GPU, stuck it on a graphics card. And these are being seeded to ISVs, to software developers, so they can begin optimizing their applications for Intel's next gen uh, graphics platform. We do not have any benchmarks uh, they intel did sort of so on stage during the press conference um intel said double the performance of gen 11 graphics now that was in tiger lake in the mobile processor that seems feasible but something to consider that most people aren't talking about on the discrete card is a discrete card's going to have much more thermal headroom it's also going to have dedicated memory running at a much higher speed than the typical mobile parts because they share memory with the system. So anyone speculating on performance on the graphics card, you know, they're like, all right, maybe you can't game in 1080p. Don't put too much stock in it because it really doesn't matter. This is for optimizing software for the architecture, not about optimizing performance because a, a true discrete GPU on a card like this with faster memory, with potentially more memory, with you know much more thermal headroom, is going to be faster than this. And this was apparently basically a duplicate of what's inside Tiger Lake. So interesting development there. 
Yeah, that'll be interesting to see how that um, plays out. Christopher, do you have any? I feel like we haven't talked to you. Any comments from the peanut gallery? <laughs> I see a couple of comments in the chat. Um, so uh, San Sanchez MTZ44, um, big Navi announcement. No, no big Navi announcement from AMD. Um, no big Navi announcement. Maybe some off the record big Navi conversations. Um, so stay tuned for big Navi news. It's it's coming. And so Craig also asked, do you think most small businesses uh, could get by with thirty nine ninety as a server? Could they? Yeah, absolutely. Most most businesses can get by with a lot less than that as a server. This is true. But do you want to use a uh, desktop processor? in a server environment. I'm not sure, like, that's the kind of thing that IT guys get fired for if something goes <laughs> wrong, e even if it has nothing to do with the choice of product. It's like, you know, a, a consultant comes in and all of a sudden it's like, why do you have this in your server? And they get in trouble. So definitely enough horsepower, probably not the platform you want to go with for a server, but yeah. in a business server, that's, that's my opinion there. <laughs> So, um, yeah, yeah there's, there's not, not much else to talk about on that Intel graphics card. There was really no details other than to say, hey, um, these are shipping. But, yeah, interesting to see uh, Intel actually have that thing live and running a game and say, hey, you know, they're, they're shipping this month. So, at least a good development. We think this year is definitely going to be the year when they launched the GP, uh, their discrete GPUs. They claimed that they were going to be. Seems like they're on track. Um, we'll see how the software um, situation shapes up. There may have been a couple of graphical glitches during the demo on screen, but, you know, who, who knows there. <laughs> what was the release date for them again? No, no hard date. No release. Okay. And so it's 2020, and as of now, three tiers of GPU have been announced. Okay. Uh, there's XCLP, the low power, which is what this was, which is essentially what's inside Tiger Lake. Uh, then there's the you know the mainstream part, which will target more you know mainstream gamers. I right. don't think they're going to go after the crazy high-end gaming enthusiasts. But then there's also the enterprise HPC GPU, uh, currently called Ponivecchio. We have a couple of articles on the site. That's a much bigger iteration for high-performance compute and uh, you know server workloads, enterprise workloads. So yeah, the, apparently I I think Intel has not said which is coming first. I, if I were to bet. Uh, XELP is coming first inside Tiger Lake, the low power one, but speculating. Perhaps the enterprise one comes first. Who knows? They could surprise us all and do them all at the same time. We are just guessing there. <laughs> pure speculation. Exactly. Um, something that's not pure speculation, except for the processor inside this device, uh, Lenovo launches the first foldable PC, a uh, first foldable display PC. There was debate that every notebook is foldable. But this is the first foldable display uh, PC. The, the Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Fold. Got my hands on it. Got to play with it. Um, really, really, really cool device. So take the, the Galaxy Fold. Make it bigger. Throw Intel platform and Windows in there. Make it so it actually doesn't break. And yeah, you've got a really cool PC. Um that folds up kind of smaller. I, I don't know what exactly what the dimensions were, but it, you know, when it's open, it's, it's taller than like a surface. You have that, I forget the aspect ratio. Um, it's that nice tall aspect. So you get more screen real estate. Um, but when it's folded up, you know, it's tiny. It's like the size of a typical paperback book. And it also has, you know, accommodations to charge the wireless keyboard when it's folded up and you throw the keyboard in between, it actually charges while it's in there. Um, so it's really cool, and, and it kind of supports the hinge. You get this nice package, everything all in one. And it also supports the, the active stylus, the pen. So really like a no-compromise convertible-type device where you can have that nice big screen if you want it. Stand, stand it up, up have, have a nice, nice big, big screen. screen. Or if you need the smaller form factor, literally fold it in half. You can slap the keyboard over the bottom half of the screen or use it separately. Just a really versatile, cool device. Marco's design oh. goals. Make sure it doesn't break. <laughs> Dave's here. Yay. And uh, we are now being hey, joined buddy. by. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing? How are we doing? Good. Someone was spying on us, man. No, no. It's just the last couple minutes. I wasn't spying on us. Boy, it's dark behind me. Let me turn up the house lights, huh? Jeez. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah, I just I just got back from the vet. Uh, the doggy was not happy, so I had to take him on a little emergency run. But everybody's doing good now, so excuse the tardiness. No, nope, no sweat. Is 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 Max home, or is he hanging out with the doc for a little while? No, Max is home. Uh, okay. He's he's 14 years old and has heart issues. So, oh, um, so his his little ticker was acting funny, and we gotta we gotta take care of him when uh, he's panting and acting, you know, not himself. So that's what I did. I scrammed there for a minute and uh, thanks for thanks for uh, taking the torch here while i was away appreciate it <laughs> nope, no sweat no so Glad we Matt's have covered well. um we we kind of uh, did uh, amd we did we did the rise in 4000 and threadripper we talked about concept ufo we talked about dg1 we just jumped into the thinkpad x1 fold dave you got you got to actually check out that device too did you agree with me really cool sort of execution by lenovo there yeah, what what was impressive to me with it was that um, it it actually was well implemented. You know, we we see folding devices, and you know, it's a re- it's a real tough slog. I mean, right now the technology, you know, to be honest, isn't quite there yet. You know, like they're still learning. You can you can see with respect to um, you know how to how to set it up ergonomically, and then how to make sure it's it's durable and it lasts and takes you know, all this flexing that's going on. So hinge design is super important and all that good stuff. Um, you know, how they, how they make that thing fold. Um, and it, to me, it seemed much more refined than I've seen with other devices, whether it be handsets and, or other folding concepts that I've seen from some of the other players as well. There's, there's plenty of others getting in the ring. It seemed really well done. Um, the other thing that was well done, what you're looking at right there, is the keyboard, the detachable keyboard. That seemed to be um, actually pretty good as well. Um, you know, it seemed it, it snaps into place, you know, sort of satisfying and lines up ni- nice and neat. Uh, there goes Marco there, my straight man doing it. Look at that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, it, I just thought it looked it looked well done so far for for such a new category of device and a, and a lofty design goal. There's a lot going on to make that thing do what it what it does, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't. I'm not sure how much of the nitty gritty details in, uh, Lenovo wanted public, but they, you know, talked to us about how they added an extra layer beneath the display for rigidity, how they made the bezel a certain size and put the soft touch around it to protect the hinges and the to add some rigidity around the screen because you don't want it, you know, shattering if you drop it on the corner and just lots of smart little things to to make it more durable. And it, it, even though the device we played with wasn't retail ready, you know, it was still an engineering sample, it felt good. Like you could use it. It literally, it, it just, it seemed really cool. And a couple of the Lenovo reps were actually carrying them around, you know, testing them out as their main devices, you know, to, to, to learn the ins and outs of the platform. Seem, seemed really cool. This was yeah. another device based on a uh, undisclosed, unnamed Intel hybrid processor. Um, so yeah, we'll have to wait to see exactly what's inside it when they launch. But yeah, really cool device, man. Yeah, we couldn't get and and we I want to ask I want to ask Brittany what what she thinks of the of the product as well. Um, you know, just in terms of ergonomics and use case. But we couldn't we couldn't get Lenovo to cough up the details on the processor in, inside. Marco and I would speculate that it was something in the Foveros Lakefield ilk, a highly integrated processor, but. They wouldn't comment. It could very well have been something, um, you know, even more next generation uh, than, you know, say uh, Ice Lake with Gen 11 graphics, but still in that traditional integrated processor versus, you know, multi-chip module hybrid design that uh, Foveros is. But um, yeah, it's it's got some cutting edge internals as well. Brittany, would you use a device like this? Does it, I mean, does that Um, foldable kind of portfolio portfolio thing do do much for you? No. Honestly, not really. And I think on this stream before, I've expressed my skepticism, skepticism excuse me, over foldable devices. So I think it's one of those things that I actually have to hold. I mean, everything you guys are saying sounds great, but, you know, I kind of want to have my own hands on it. Um, simply because, as you guys kind of pointed out, the technology is not always there. It seems like they are making a lot of smart decisions to make it more usable. Um, for me, the question is, like, because it, especially with kind of my, my day job, if you will, I'm often quite mobile. Am I going to lug around a separate screen and a keyboard and all of that? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know how really practical that is for everyday life. So is it something I'm 
would be willing to try. Yeah. Is it something I'm going to convert to tomorrow? Probably not. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I could see, I could see use cases where it could be very handy. For example, a doctor's office, for example, where you need something very portable, um, that's a full PC, but you know, tucks into your pocket quickly. You take from patient to patient, you know, the doc, the doctor comes in now and, you know, starts banging away on the keyboard in front of you. Everything's computer inputted these days in, in the medical profession. So good, good potential use case there. Um, yeah, Marco, you, you, Marco, you like little petite computers. Would you, would you, uh, <laughs> would you, would you deal with this thing? Yes and no. So <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, like, I love how small it is folded. Like I, I would have zero issue using a device that size with the small keyboard. Um, you know, I carry around a, an XPS 13 now. Great, beautiful machine. Absolutely love it. I, I could, I used to carry an 11.6 inch machine, so I could go smaller and still get by and be productive. My issue is the form factor. I need something lappable. So if like if right. I if I know I'm going to be at a space where I have a table or a desk or somewhere to put it, yes, I would totally love to carry around something that small. If I think I'm going to be sitting in a random chair, or I have to put it on my lap, then then like I can't function with these kickstand based devices. Like a Surface doesn't work for me in that regard. So it would it would totally depend. I I, I like the device. It's foldables are the future. You know that someone will come up with a creative way, maybe dual hinges, where you have the best of a clamshell um, plus the foldable display. But having all of that screen real estate when you need it is pretty awesome. Like when you see it standing up on the table when we tested it, that's a big screen for a device that's super tiny when folded. Yeah, yeah. What did what did you think about um, the the experience of of tapping on glass with this new type of display that Lenovo was using? They had this. It's an OLED display, a flexible OLED display, but it had it had two things. And I think a lot of these flexible designs employ the same design. They had stainless steel laminate in the display underneath that helps with um, rigidity, so there's no flex when you're when you're tapping on it or when you're using it as a a work surface, if you will. Um, and then it also had like a it's a, it's plastic OLED, right? So there's it's not glass. It's a little softer and smoother to the touch when you, you know, pull up Microsoft's uh, on-screen keyboard, right? Yeah. So you don't have what I'd call the coldness of typing on glass. It definitely had a softer touch. Um, as I've said for years, since like Microsoft was pushing Windows 8 and Metro, um, touch, unless it's more efficient than an a- actual input devices, I think most people would not choose it for work. And no matter what, I don't think, even though it is it is better than a pure glass experience, I still think the keyboard is going to be a better experience. So I probably would rarely, if ever, use input on glass. I might might use the pen. Um, I'm still, you know, I'm old enough where sometimes I still do write down notes instead of typing everything in. So I, I might use the pen. And that, too, was a really good experience. Um, the way it felt, the pen that was there was just a demo wasn't working. But to feel what it feels like typing on the plastic OLED um, felt good, yeah. but yeah. Um, that's that's I what I was thinking, guy. actually. When when you said pen input, that's what I was thinking for Brittany. Brittany, Professor Brittany would, would <laughs> yeah. pull this out in class and start saying, uh, listen up, students, and then, you know, <laughs> refer to her, her, her handy, handy notepad, notepad. My on digital um, notepad, yeah. Well, and then they all complained that they couldn't see it, so that, that would be the caveat. Yeah, I mean, personally, um, I'm not a huge. I mean, I do like to use pen and paper, as demonstrated literally by like the planner yeah. I have sitting on my desk and stuff. Well, I don't love stylus, like the stylus. It's just for me, I just don't personally enjoy them, though I know a lot of people do. Um, and as Marco pointed out, I would probably, if I did have the device, I'd probably stick mostly with the keyboard, just because I do like the. Um, the sensory feeling, I just, I feel more confident typing on a keyboard than I would on the glass. So I'll be interested to try it out. Like I said, I've, I've been skeptical about foldable devices, but perhaps finally we have a company that's getting it right and this is the future and we'll all be using foldable devices in 10 years. So we'll just have to see. Um, I can be a bit of a bit old fashioned and a bit of a curmudgeon when it comes to <laughs> new types of uh, no, you're laptops just- and stuff. You're just you're just full bred straight on geek. You need that keyboard, is what you're saying. I need There's nothing the wrong with that. 
We have a mechanical <laughs> keyboard with, with our desktop. desktop. I need the keyboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no I, I can, can totally, totally relate. relate. I'm the same way. I I couldn't I couldn't bang on glass either. No. Um, and that little chiclet would be too small for me. I, I do like a, a little bit larger machine. For me, the ideal ultra portable machine is a 14 inch format versus the you know the ones that are real small 13.3s. Right. Um, but um, but yeah, um, actually you know Dell's XPS 13 lately has been just you know catching my eye for sure. But I as a as a rule have historically been on ThinkPad X1 Carbon mm -hmm. just because of the, frankly because of the fantastic keyboard you know Lenovo's ThinkPad line is just awesome so right. yeah yeah it's all trade offs but i think it's great to see the OEMs as as you pointed out Marco that the OEMs actually bringing this thing to market in a refined you know form that is functional and looks like finished product versus some sort of kludge franken prototype machine right <clears throat> yeah. and it's yeah, good to absolutely. have options i, I, I think, think having variety and having options this could end up being the ideal machine for somebody right could, like you mentioned like the doctor's office that would be a great place to have this kind of device so um it definitely has its place and i like to see companies doing things that are different and offering new types of devices so we'll just have to see how it all plays out at the end Craig, Craig asks in the, in the chat, he says, 4 by 3 or 1610 on that display? I can't remember, Mark. I think it was 4 by 3 It was 4 by 3 It might have even yeah. been taller than that. I, I don't remember if it was a custom form factor, uh, custom aspect ratio. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was. It's closer to 4 3 than 1610 though. All right. Well, we should should we move on to the well? And the other thing, actually, before we move on, is we should note that it's five G capable. Or they they noted it was five G capable, and they said it was Qualcomm five G chipset on board. So that's an important distinction for a device in this category as well. Ultra mobile having that ubiquitous connectivity of of um, of cellular connectivity versus just being uh, strapped to Wi Fi. Um, that helps a lot as well in the use case. So that, that makes sense for a device like that. Um, yeah. So that's a, another little, um, highlight point, I guess, for that, that type of product. Um, but, uh, so should we move on to, to the windows seven to windows 10? Because I know you have a lot of tips up your sleeve there, buddy on that sure <laughs> yeah so, uh, as i was saying uh, in the beginning that we have a, so a ton of ces coverage we literally just scratched the surface here with some of the highlights so if you haven't been by hothardware.com definitely come by the news page uh check out our our ces 2020 landing page so much so much information came out of ces um it seemed like a fairly strong show for um for the pc so yeah come by the site but uh, another other big development in the in the PC space uh, today it was today or yesterday. Um, mm. Microsoft has wound down support official support for Windows Seven and is basically pushing people to Windows Ten now. And we put up a little short piece on basically how to make sure your PC is best prepared for that Windows 7 to Windows 10 migration. I know most of us super nerds have been on Windows 10 for years. If yeah. you're one of those guys that's going to comment in the chat and say how horrible Windows 10 is, just sign <laughs> off right now. You're, still, <laughs> you're a worse curmudgeon than Brittany. Right. Windows 10 <laughs> is awesome. So, yeah. But... Hey, As I like Windows case. 10, okay? Yeah, I mean, Windows, <laughs> Windows it's, it's been out years now. Of course, yeah. there's still kinks with certain hardware configurations, and anytime there's a big patch, yeah, some machines get borked, but we've been living with that for 30 years of Windows, whatever. But <laughs> the piece we have up, like, so here's my philosophy, right? When if, if you're not going to do a clean, fresh reformat, you want to take your maintenance into your own hands your app updates into your own hands and you want to eliminate as many variables as possible that could interfere with the install. So we have a little short piece up basically saying, you know, you want to purge a bunch of crappy old data. You want to make sure your apps, your, your key apps are updated. You want to back up all of your personal data and Which also you do should things do anyway. Right. <laughs> you should do anyway. That's, That's good, good advice. advice. Listen to Brittany. And then also, you know, disable antivirus or anti malware mm -hmm. stuff because they are notorious for messing with complex OS installations like that. So, really cool piece that, uh, that Brandon put up. Short to the point. If you need help with this kind of stuff, ask in the chat and other hot hardware readers or one of us would probably help. But yeah, if, you, if you're still on Windows 7, even though Windows 10 is a free upgrade, and we have a bunch of those articles up too, and how to get your free Windows 10, here's a bunch of tips to make sure it goes smoothly for you, and you don't uh, you don't screw your PC up. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's, you know, something to note for the average consumer. There's lots of reasons why Microsoft offers free Windows 10 uh, if you have a valid <laughs> Windows 7 or Windows 8 license key. Clearly, the model is um, lots of different service types of uh, product offerings from Microsoft versus just the OS company that we all know and love so well from over the years. Um, Strong Veek says Windows 10 <laughs> is trash, but that's okay. Strong. Everybody has an opinion. <laughs> I was just going to say, so are, are you are you on Linux or Windows 7, man? Because if you're on <laughs> Windows 7, you're silly. And if you're on Linux, I don't know. You must really we hate We can't yourself. help you. Yeah, we can't no. help you with that one. <laughs> Marco, Marco is the resident, uh, the resident Microsofty. No question about it. He is a fan of of things Microsoft. Um, but you know, to be balanced, I, I would agree with you. It's it's been a very solid OS. You know, probably my favorite version of Windows ever. Uh, and we do a lot more complex things with it these days than we ever ha had back in the days when Windows, true. yeah, then Windows Seven came out. I mean, we're doing all kinds of stuff we we haven't done. The fact that you have a, even a feature for Microsoft called windows your phone that is starting to integrate the the, the handset with the o the desktop os is is kind of cool i mean it's still in its infancy but um you know that feature but um yeah lots of lots of interesting hooks these days but yeah i mean you know so there's a reason it's free out there they want you to step over into the waters and and get into the <laughs> windows 10 ecosystem obviously but it's also a damn good OS, I think, too. I would agree with you, Marco. <laughs> Spoke right. Spoken like a true IT manager geek, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> I also want to add, to that um, even though Windows 10 is being offered free in a lot of places, one thing we did write about in a previous article is you do want to be careful about how many devices you're trying to update. So if you have one or two devices, it shouldn't be a problem. If you're trying to get Windows 10 keys for 100 devices, you're going to want to be more careful with that. So I just wanted to add that as a caveat. Mm. I would guess that most people are only trying to update a device or two. But if you do work for, let's say, a small company or something like that, you should go through more official channels. Ah, ah I see. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's, now, it's always to, to build on that point, something else to keep in mind is Windows 10 will still activate with any good Windows 8, Windows yes. 8.1, or Windows 7 key. Yes. So as long as you have your unique product key, if if you sh and you if you have the Windows 10 media, you should be able to install it yourself yeah. anyway. Right. So. Right. And that and that's kind of my point is make sure you have your keys and you're doing it, you know, doing it honestly, especially if you're trying to update a, a multiple devices, you know, with more than maybe your home PC or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, always good advice uh, to make sure your licensing is up to snuff. No question about it. But um, the, the good news is. If you're on Windows 7 or Windows 8, uh, Microsoft says, come on over. The, the water's just fine. <laughs> and, uh, and and Marco, you know, that, that article, uh, as Marco points out, um, we sort of collaborated on the information in that article and, and piecing it together. There are some, there's some definite best tips to follow a, a you know, sort of a methodical setup before you migrate. I, I encourage you to, to read that article. For just some basic stuff, it seems obvious and and sort of it's the kind of stuff you know inside that you probably should do, but might not might not remember. But you'll pay later on. And and how many times over the years have I called you, buddy Marco? And and because I am the proverbial hack, I want to get something done. <laughs> I am I am impatient, and so I'll just jam it through and hope it works. And that's not the way to fly usually. <laughs> <laughs> do as we say, not as we do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be, I, I, just, I can't count the number of times I've called Marco, man, you know, I'm trying to get this, you know, installation to set for the test rig and you know, it's, it's, it's not booting now. And he's like, well, did you fresh format? I'm like, no, heck no. I just <laughs> moved everything over and booted it and hoped for the best. <laughs> no, no. You know, I will say, um, I, 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 this isn't, this is semi shady, half shady, right? Cause it, it's, uh -oh. it's, oh no, I know. I, well, close your I, ears, Christopher. I use a, a window. There's a group that basically, um, adds all of the windows updates to windows as they're released. 
So I keep a Windows 10 installer. You know, every like month or two, I'll just update it. So I have the fewest number of updates I need to run after a fresh Windows install. And then I'm also, I'm a psycho about keeping all of the apps. Like if I have about 20 key apps that are on my PC at any given time, and I keep a folder and a flash drive with all my apps in there. And if if I have downtime sometimes, I'm like, all right, let me just run through my list and grab all the latest installers. So all that I have that stuff all up to date all the time. So if I have to start fresh, like if my hard drive, if my SSD blew up tonight, I can put a new SSD in and have all my stuff installed in like an hour from clean, from nothing. The, the full Windows 10 install when it's pre-updated like that, it's like, I don't know, 10 minutes on a fast PC, including the, the couple of Windows updates you need to run after the fact. And then it's like, bang, just run through a bunch of app installers and you're done. Yeah, just, <laughs> just bang, you know? Bang it out. Marco, Marco and Chris are the kind of guys that ask, how do you spell OCD? <laughs> you spell it m-a-r-c-o <laughs> there you go there you go well no it's it's good stuff uh if you haven't uh, converted that windows 7 pc please please think about it because being unpatched and insecure is um not not a good thing these days yeah 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 and if um if they're ocd i'm a bit of a paranoid parrot and so i think it's it is important to make sure that you have that you are able to receive those security updates right because if you're still on windows 7 you're not going to be able to and heaven forbid something happens so and you know, i know yeah. multiple people like i have gotten hit with ransomware so it, right. it's a real threat if your it PC is, is not threat. up to date my my i have i we work with a small accounting firm that handles everything for hh and they got hit with ransomware and it was free i was a little nervous i'm like you get my stuff okay <laughs> you know <laughs> and it was right. they had backups thankfully but their whole office was crippled for a week with ransomware and they and they had all i think i think they even went back as far as xp in a couple of spots but they had nice. mostly windows 7 machines they had mostly windows 7 yeah and so I'm like, you guys, you're crazy, you know. It's, you know, so they tapped on my, you know, on, on me for some information this time, you know, on and on best practice moving forward for their IT infrastructure in their little office. But um, yeah, I was like, yeah, no, you guys, you guys can't fly that way. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, man. Not yeah, allowed. Especially, especially with that kind of information too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they 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 locked it down after the fact, but learned a hard lesson, and it took a lot of man hours, but they uh, they were able to piece it back together. So yeah, you know, you, you don't have to be an accountant, you don't have to be a uh, you know enterprise superstar to get hit. Um, and when your stuff is, you know, whatever ransomed or corrupt or full of malware, you're you know, you're gonna be an unhappy camper. <laughs> Remind, remind, remind you, I'm making notes now. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we'll, 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 yes, duly noted. We'll come back for that, Chris, because that's, uh, it sounds like a, a good article. Folks need to know this stuff. And that's, that's actually what we try and do at Hot Hardware is, is provide insightful, useful information. We're not just here to, um, you know, uh, thump brand names and product uh, evaluations. It's more like, hey, what what can you glean from from the information we're offering that's useful in your world? That's what we we hope to strike uh, when we provide our content um, to the to the interwebs. Um, are we uh, are we in wrap up? Time? I think so. I yeah. think yeah, we. I actually, think we're done. Covered pretty much everything. Yeah. Cool. So we should mention before we <clears throat> sign off, and and Marco, I'll I'll. I'll I'll let you, uh, if you, if you don't mind diving into the, um, the giveaway that just finished up with Lenovo over the holidays for the new year and, uh, in celebration of CES 2020 and our 20th anniversary, which was just insane that we've been around this long. Um, yeah, we gave away, we're giving away a bunch of free stuff to which we haven't announced the winners yet. Right. Yeah. So, uh, we haven't let gleam do its thing and pick the winners, but yeah, uh, just ended. We had three really, really cool prizes from Lenovo first place, a killer, uh, ThinkPad X one yoga. So really nice notebook. Second prize is a Lenovo smart display. And third prize was a Lenovo smart clock. So you can't come and enter anymore that it did actually mm -hmm. end, but we should be announcing the winner soon. Have it up in the next couple of days. That and the moral of the story is 
as they say, the old saying goes, there's always another one coming. We're like trains at, at Hot Hardware. We have another giveaway coming. It's on the horizon. And uh, yeah, so so stay tuned in the weeks ahead. We will probably be, you know, we've been in a mode. I don't know, Marco. I wanted to pick your brain on this, but, you know, we're doing it live here in the air. It might be dangerous. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Jump right in on that one. I teed it up for you. Um, <clears throat> but, <laughs> But no, I mean, w- lately we've been in this mode of uh, killer gaming systems in concert with a bunch of brands to build something up to give away. Are we maybe going back to that next? Does that sound like? I, I think we should. So if if you're not a regular, this was our third giveaway in about a month and a half. We did two crazy high-end gaming PCs and now this you know really cool array of products from Lenovo. Um, <coughs> we just had, <coughs> excuse me. Our 20th anniversary, so that's sort of what kicked off all these really good giveaways. But I see no reason why I shouldn't build something and give it away. We just have to hammer out the details, man. Like, you know, that's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's that, and then we also we teamed up. Like the last one we did, we teamed up with Thermaltech, who built a rig as well. It was a um, absolutely killer red Radeon AMD gaming rig uh, with uh, Ryzen under the hood, Ryzen red Radeon rig. Um, lots of R's going on and, and it was pretty fabulous. Um, so yeah, stick around for that and, and you could win um, some, what's that? I was saying, and if the view, if ever, everyone is interested, we could always do like we did, um, with the 20th anniversary giveaway, another gaming stream too, if that's something people are into, oh, yeah. um, possibly. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. If if a lot of times what we can do is, is get a hold of these systems and let you guys Tee them up for the stream. Is that what you were thinking for a game? Or just, stream, right? or just, um, like I know that a lot of people enjoyed our last gaming stream, even though we didn't have the device on hand. But doing a game that maybe is related, um, to the system, or just playing some cool new stuff because 2020 is apparently a really good gaming year. So, um, if that's something people are interested, in, maybe trying that out again as well. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that, that that's right. We we did this giveaway with Falcon Northwest and and uh, Obsidian Entertainment, who is the the developer for Outer Worlds. Yes. And you guys gamed in the in the Outer Worlds just to uh, you know sort of kick off a little bit of that uh, that giveaway. That was cool. Yeah. So we can we can do that too. We can bring some game devs in. Craig Dieter asks, "Are we going to PAX East?" I I think so. I applied for. We're my talking about it. <laughs> Yeah, I applied for my credentials, and and I know Britt and Chris, you guys are thinking about it too. So, right. I think we'll have boots on the ground there. Yeah, that's that's that might be the case. So, <clears throat> it's always fun. Pax East and in Boston is always a good time. It is fun <laughs> in Boston. All right. Well, I think with that, guys, thanks for um teeing up this episode without me. I appreciate it. I'm no sorry problem. to have to scramble away and in doggy emergency there. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good stuff. And uh, everybody else, thanks for joining us. And we're going to try and be back here uh, next Wednesday at 530. That's when we typically try and stream, although sometimes work conflicts uh, get in the way and we push it to another night. We we typically try and hit Wednesdays at 530 Eastern. Stop by hothardware.com where you can find us on the web, twitter.com slash hothardware, Facebook, Hot Hardware. We're all over the place. Just look for us. And um, yeah, we'd love to chat with you and tweet with you and Of course, correspond with you at hothardware.com. And uh, thanks for stopping by.